This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Good morning, gang. How are we on this beautiful fall day? Fall is not only in the air, but it's also in the leaves, isn't it? I have noticed here lately that we're getting some beautiful fall color. Particularly, what I've noticed is a lot of our red maples. Our red maples are just going wild and crazy with their beautiful yellow and red colors. Even oranges. They are a pretty selection. If you don't have a red maple in your landscape, I would recommend you to do that. It is a native plant. Acer rubrum is the botanical name, but nobody cares about that. What we care about is the beautiful fall foliage and the shade that it provides us in the summertime. But, again, fall is in the air. It's in the leaves. Um, And I want to let you know that later in the program, I am going to tell you why leaves change color. Okay? I want to let you know uh, more of the science behind uh, why leaves change and what is going on in that leaf. Just like humans... uh, Uh, trees and shrubs are living organisms and we change over time don't we i assume that if you look in the mirror today it's probably different than looking in the mirror 30 years ago or whatever well uh (laughs) we don't have to get into age of course but um anyhow if you hang on tight we'll be able to uh to do that uh, later in the program um also, I uh, hope that you were able to enjoy. I know last week we didn't open the lines. Uh, it was our special Halloween episode of Let's Get Growing here in the garden. Uh, we told stories of plants that are a bit dangerous, and I hope that you enjoyed that. But if you missed that, um, it was plants that are dangerous, deadly even. If you'd like to revisit that, you can always watch uh, or listen to our old shows on YouTube.com. Just go to YouTube.com and search WRWH, and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you'll know when uh, new programming has been uploaded to that site. Um, But uh, if you didn't uh, know, uh, the week before last, we had the Commissioner of Agriculture, Gary uh, Gary Black. He was on the program, and he discussed with us the effects of Hurricane Michael in South Georgia, uh, where crops have been demolished and farmers have been devastated. Uh, So definitely, if you want to check those out, just go to YouTube.com. And also, of course, you may be listening to the program this morning on the radio, which is wonderful. But if you are away uh, from the radio, you can also listen on the TuneIn app. Now, the TuneIn app is an app that you can download onto your smartphone. If you've got a smartphone, you can just search TuneIn uh, wherever you buy your apps and your app store. And once you download TuneIn, it's easy. Just Uh, Type in WRWH, and it'll give you this little button you can click that's in the shape of a heart. And you just click that for WRWH because you already heart WRWH. You You love WRWH. So be sure to like uh, and and make it your favorite on the TuneIn app for sure. Now, you can also, another way to watch, I just want to remind you, is on... um, on Facebook, we uh, I say watch because we have a video aspect on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, you can uh, search WRWH and you can watch the uh, the program stream live. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, we have a bit of a uh, error on <laughs> the human side for our Facebook, um, and it's not up yet. But by the end of the show, uh, hopefully before so, maybe just in a few minutes, we'll be streaming live, and not only will you be able to listen, but you'll be able to see my beautiful face, <laughs> which is not that beautiful. So. I don't want to uh, hype that up too much. But uh, those are other ways you can listen and watch. Um, If you uh, are away from the radio, you can follow us. And programming uh, that WRWH does throughout the week, you can uh, listen that way uh, through your smartphone. Now, this morning, the the, uh, White County Fire Department has given to us a smoke detector to give away. A smoke detector. Of course... Daylight savings time is coming up, and that's your reminder to change the battery in your smoke detector. This program is called One in Every Home, and the White County Fire Department is giving them away. And they've given us, I mean, they've given us one to give away to you. The only thing you have to do is call in. You'll answer a question. The question is this. The question to receive this uh, free smoke alarm is, do you set your clock forwards one hour or backwards one hour tonight? At 2 o'clock. What do you do this season? Do you give your clock a jump start going forward or a back start going backwards? If you can call in uh, 706-865-3181, my producer Buster Talent will be glad to 
find out uh, if you have the right answer to that question, and we will get your information and get you a smoke alarm. Now, the smoke alarm, of course, we can't necessarily. Um, we have to. You have to do. Have to sign a little waiver, which just says, "Hey, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work." But all right. Now I know I'm a yeah. terrible producer. Uh oh. I was out of the studio while you were doing that. What question? <laughs> oh yes. What question? Am I making sure they yes. answer correctly? So the <laughs> question is: Do you set your clock forwards or backwards? One, uh, do you set it forwards or backwards one hour tonight? Which way do we go? All right. So that's it, folks. If you can answer that what question. What caller? Oh, yeah. Would, caller number nine, because you should change your, um, no, six. Caller number six, because I think you have to change your smoke detector twice in a year. So caller number six. Caller number six will receive this, and if you can uh, get the question right, of course. Caller number six. And the reason I say that is because you should be changing the uh, nine volt battery. Well, at least once a year or sooner. But because the time changes uh, twice in a year, let's do it twice a year, right? We don't want to. We don't want to get caught. We don't want to get caught in the uh, house with a um, with a faulty smoke detector or a dead smoke detector, do we? So again, you can call that in. And the reason we bring this up is a perfect time is because um, we should be uh, later on. I'm going to talk a bit about why does the time change? What is this daylight savings time? You probably think it has something to do with farming, and I did for a long time. But I've got a great article that explains exactly why, exactly why um, that happens. So uh, this morning again, we've got a really big show. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about a lot of things in the garden. We're going to talk about a lot of cool things. We're um, uh, things we should be doing, things that we maybe should have already done, kind of remind ourselves for next year. Um, but uh, definitely, there's some things that we need to be doing this time of year. Hey, folks, it's fall time, which is the best time to plant, the best time to plant. So we're going to get more into that. But before we do, um, I want to take a few moments and inspire us a bit. Inspire us a bit about autumn. Inspire us a bit about um, what fall means to us. So before we talk about jobs that need to be done in the garden, let's get inspired by fall and let's step back and just kind of watch the leaves turn. So this morning we um, we have uh, a quote from Bonario Overstreet. He says, Autumn asks that we prepare for the future, that we be wise in the ways of garner, garnering and keeping, but it also asks that we learn to let go. To acknowledge the beauty of sparseness. The beauty of sparseness, he says, that's what fall is. And you know, sometimes we try to overcomplicate things. But uh, isn't there a beauty in simplicity? Just, just the simple facts of nature, the simple views of nature. And this is a good point to mention. You know, you don't have a lot of um, tree leaves on the trees this time of year. So you don't have that feeling you did in summer and spring. But we do have what we call the architecture of a tree. We have the architecture of a tree. What does that mean? The architecture of the tree is the branches, the stems. And see, we don't get to see those all summer long. We get to see them in the fall time and and throughout winter. So when you're planting a tree, think about what shape does the tree give you in the fall time, in the winter time, when there are no leaves on it. The beauty of sparseness. Elizabeth Lawrence writes, she is a wonderful southern um, from history, probably like the 50s and 60s is when she was most active. But she is a wonderful southern garden writer. And she writes this, even if something is left undone, everyone must take time to sit still and watch the leaves turn. You know, I think that despite all of the work that we need to be doing, sometimes we forget that the purpose of gardening is to enjoy nature, relax and live in it, relax and live in it. So again, sometimes you just need to sit back and watch the leaves turn. Now here's from Thomas More, uh, a little bit of poetry. So a little bit of rhyming. Every season hath its pleasures. Spring may boast her flowery prime, yet the vineyard's ruby treasures brighten autumn's soberer time a soberer time kind of a relax a relaxative that doesn't sound very good though does it but a relaxative atmosphere that's kind of what fall and autumn is isn't it you know you think about spring it's busy it's exciting things are moving quickly things are growing but in fall time things are kind of sober Autumn backs off and things get quiet and still. And you go out into the wilderness, there's not as many birds chirping, are there? There's not as many uh, other critters roaming around except probably pesky squirrels or chipmunks, which can do a terror in your beds and your pots. Trust me, I had that problem. But anyhow, it's a soberer time in the autumn. Here's another one for us. Albert Camus says, Autumn is a second spring when every leaf is a flower. 
Every leaf is a flower. Don't you think that the colors of the leaves on the trees are almost as impressive as the colors of the spring tulips and daffodils? I think so. I think that you look out and you see, like with Father Gilla. If you don't have a Father Gilla plant, you need to come to Lanier Nursery and Gardens and Flowery Branch and definitely come check out Father Gilla. They're still green now, but they will turn to this mottled yellow, red, orange, all of these beautiful colors. And so um, just as impressive, maybe more so, uh, a flower a leaf in fall is is absolutely gorgeous. And so, again, uh, we're talking about daffodils. Rose Kinsley, she touches on this. She says, In the garden, autumn is indeed the crowning glory of the year, bringing us the fruition of months of thought and care and toil. And at no season, safe perhaps a daffodil time, do we get such superb color effects as from August to November. And I think she's right about that. You know, as you're driving through the mountains and the hills here in, in, in northeast Georgia, be sure to look at the leaves. I don't know how you could forget it. I don't know how you could. I mean, these huge, gigantic uh, plants, some of them 100 foot tall, right? They are now sporting all their glory. Whereas the little tulips in the spring are one thing. These beautiful, huge plants are another, right? Um, how about this? Autumn, the year's last loveliest smile. The year's last loveliest smile. Now, before nature goes to sleep for winter, think about this. She gives us one last smile. She says, look outside. Look at these brilliant uh, red maple leaves. Look at these brilliant yellow golden leaves of the ginkgo tree, whatever it may be. The last, the year's last loveliest smile. And lastly, John Burroughs says, how beautiful leaves grow old. How full of light are color and color are their last days. You know, you think about this. That leaf you see hanging on the tree, this is the end of that uh, leaf's life. That leaf will never come back. That leaf doesn't regenerate. It just, it, the tree continues to grow and new leaves will put out. But think about this. Its last life, its last few days are probably the most impressive moments of its life. And you know, I got to thinking that um, you think about these leaves, their last moments of life are the most impressive. Perhaps we ought to strive for our best days, uh, for our last days to be our best days, to be the most important of our lives. Let's continue to work to make um, a good and a happy life and a, a life that ends well. You know, that's what we look at that the garden can teach us. The garden can teach us these beautiful things. And I want to go ahead and announce our winner for the smoke detector. Boy, people were jumping on the lines. These smoke detectors are hot, no pun intended. But Ruth Bowen is the winner of the smoke detector. And Ruth got the question right. The question, of course, was do you set your clocks forward or backwards? And you fall backwards in the fall. So we set our clocks back. Now, what that means for us is that we get one extra hour of sleep, right? Because our 8 o'clock is 7 o'clock. So if you wake up at 7 o'clock, you're not waking up at 7 o'clock. You're waking up at old 8 o'clock. So <laughs> it does get confusing. But the point is, folks, uh, and we're going to talk more about daylight savings time in this, uh, in, in this first half hour uh, when we come back. But um, the, the hour falls backwards in the fall. Spring forward and fall back. Spring forward and fall back. Now that we've been inspired a bit by nature and autumn, let's talk about what we should be doing. Let's get to work in the garden. What should we be doing in autumn? And what we should be doing, I will get right back with you in a moment. So hold on tight because, you know, we are going to talk about some of the beautiful things that we need to do before it gets too cold. So hang on tight. We'll be right back. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in to 93.9 FM WRWH, Saturday mornings at 9. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Well, good morning, folks. Welcome back to the program. It has been a wonderful, beautiful morning. It's been a morning of of unusualities. Unusualities. I just make up words left and right, don't I? This morning, before we get into some of the heavy garden topics. I want to introduce you to a new word, a word that I was introduced to just this morning. Now, the, um, the word is grumpy, grumpy. Buster, do you have any idea what grumpy means? Could you define that? Any, any uh, the fee throws me off. I, I don't <laughs> know does, what direction it's going. All right. <laughs> well, let me give you a hint. Here we go. So grumpy is a Scottish word, but it's English. Okay. And that uh, E on the end, you're right, that E on the end is confusing. But it's a lot like um, like we say with uh, sweetie or doggy, um, something like that. But it's a, a Scottish word, and I, maybe if I read this little um, poem to you, uh, it's, it's sort of a poem. It's just a little saying, I guess. 
Grumpy smells the weather, and Grumpy sees the one. He keens when clouds will gather and s'more the blinking sun. <laughs> the Grumpy is a pig. Grumpy is the a common word for pig in the Scottish world. Isn't that interesting? Listen to this. Um, J. W. J. Humphreys uh, wrote in 1911. He says this extravagant tribute to the pig as a weather prophet is typical of a large number of proverbs, though perhaps no other animal has been credited with actually seeing the wind. That little line there that says, and Grumpy sees the wound, the wound is the wind. And so um, I just thought it was an interesting word because Grumpy is an exclusively Scottish word. It was used in the 1800, uh, 18th century, but the 1700s. And it was a, the, a version of the, the verb grump, which means to grunt. And it sounds like the, the noise that pigs make and some humans make, the grump, the grunt. So maybe this morning you're a little grumpy and uh, you're a little gr- grunting around. But we need to be grunting around out in the garden and landscape. Now, I know you're like, how are you going to get from that to gardening? Well, <clears throat> let's say this. Pigs, like other animals, are great to have because they produce manure. Now, pig manure is not the best thing, but... Um, Particularly, I wouldn't use it in the garden, but I would use cow or horse or chicken manure. All of those, all of those manures are wonderful additions to the landscape. So now that I'm back into landscaping, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, you look around this um, uh, nation, and it seems, especially with Tuesday coming up. Tuesday is voter day. Tuesday is the day to vote, election day, and we see some division. Don't you think? We see a lot of heavy division, divisive words, things like that. You know, I think we all just need to get around a garden and work together. But speaking of division, we're not going to get into politics, of course, because this is a garden show. But there is a kind of division that you can do in your landscape. And this kind of division that I'm alluding to is dividing things, uh, perennial plants, perennial plants like daylilies, irises, peonies, all of these plants have these tuberous roots, and if they're starting to overcrowd each other, if they're starting to fill in the area that they're in, uh, maybe they're four or five years old, it's probably about time to go ahead and divide those suckers. So what you want to do is you want to, for instance, let's talk about daylilies, just to, to make it clear, because most people probably have daylilies. Daylilies have these nice, fleshy, tuberous roots, right? However, how you want to approach them is you want to cut a circle around the daylily clump with a shovel that's about 12 inches away from the center. So you measure out from the clump and get a little extra room and start making a circle around them. And you're trying to separate and splice the roots from the soil. That's what you're trying to do. And then once you pry that root ball out of the ground, you can remove each stalk of daylilies with just a little wad of roots at the base, okay? So be sure that you take a stalk of daylily with a little wad of roots, and you can take that and plant it back into the garden bed. Or you could put it in a container, give it to a friend. You could wrap it in a moist paper towel, give it to somebody uh, pretty soon. Uh, it can't stay in the moist paper towel for very long, but it could um, stay in. It, you can definitely put it into back into the ground. And then you've got this wad of, this huge wad of daylilies that you are now dividing and making more of plant babies for free you don't even have you don't even have to um to to uh, purchase them but if you don't want to go that trouble or maybe you don't have any day lilies or irises or things like that i do at the nursery uh that's lanier nursery and gardens you can come visit me eight to six monday through friday eight to four on saturday and we're located very conveniently in flowery branch about two miles off of the interstate 985 so definitely um come and see us there and I need to, since we're talking about irises, daylilies, peonies, I need to mention this. Lanier Nursery and Gardens will have 500 day, uh, peonies, 500 peonies in the spring, and they're going to be at a great price. Um, they're hard to find. Peonies are hard to find, and normally they're expensive, but we worked with a local grower. She is awesome. She's amazing at what she does, and uh, we, of course, try to keep everything we either sell or produce locally, and so you know that uh, these peonies are going to be local. So be sure to come in the spring and put that on your calendar. Springtime for peonies. Feel free to... Um, to uh to come to Lanier Nursery and Gardens. I also want to mention that if you have a question, I've 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 selected a few topics this morning to talk about that I thought would be helpful. 
Um, but uh, if you have a topic that you want to bring to the table, feel free to give us a call at 706-865-3181, and you can be part of the discussion here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and discuss a little bit about daylight savings time. Sometimes we think that Benjamin Franklin, we think that uh, the farmers, that they actually invented daylight savings time, but that's not exactly true. I found a great article. It's written by Patrick Allen on uh, lifehacker.com, and I thought that I would try to bring about what he says um, in the United States, how daylight savings time happened. Because actually daylight savings time was an idea that was came about in Great Britain by a couple of scientists. Uh, his name is George Hudson and, and uh, William Willett. And um, anyhow, we... Uh, they, uh, I'm getting fumbled here because I'm losing my train of thought. But they said, hey, this is a good idea. We should change the time uh, forward and backward. And uh, the idea wasn't really a catch on. It, it came into play. It came out of play. But what did it do in the United States? In the United States, um, it s- started in 1918 and... That was around the time of the First World War. Sorry, I am definitely losing my train of thought here. Um, but it had nothing to do with farmers. They didn't. They weren't asking for more time. They weren't asking to, for work because think about this. No matter what time it is, a farmer is still going to get up with the sun. The sun is what's most important. And so that didn't really matter. That didn't really matter so much. They actually were opposed to the idea because, um, again, they're not dictated by scheduling. Their schedules, not, the farmers' schedules, are not dictated by time. It's dictated by not the clock, but by the sun. And it made things very confusing for farmers. It made it hard to get work done for them. But actually, the daylight savings time was implemented in the states for the same wartime fuel saving reasons that it was done in Great Britain and Germany and, and, and overseas. The idea was. It was great for the recreational and the retail entities. Think about it. If you have more daylight after you get home from work, then what can you do? You can go out. You can shop. You can play golf, whatever it is that you uh, can't do in the dark. You can go do it now. And that's mainly why we still have daylight savings time to this day. Um, But, again, it made a brief in and out throughout time. Um, Daylight savings was popular. Then it wasn't. But then in in the 1960s, um, the Time Magazine <laughs> called it uh, called there was a chaos of clocks because by the 1960s there was this um, by the 1960s there was um, you you could drive 30 minutes and go through three or four different time zones and it was very chaotic and that's why Time Magazine called it a chaos of clocks but. In the 1966, then there was a Uniform Time Act that fixed all of these problems. It standardized daylight savings time for the country, even though some states opted out if they wanted to stay on the standard time. And particularly, in the end, Arizona and Hawaii opted out, and the rest of the country has to change their clocks twice a year. So if you drive through Arizona, if you drive through Hawaii, if you go to Hawaii, you won't be changing your clocks. But you will here in the state of Georgia. And again, folks, just as Ruth Bowen knows... We need to fall backwards. We need to set our clocks back this weekend. Now that we have fumbled through the daylight savings discussion, let's get in for tips for getting last year's poinsettias to rebloom. Now, this uh, comes from Debbie. Debbie called in and left us a message to answer tips for getting last year's poinsettias to rebloom. Okay, so um, what's going on with poinsettias is that beautiful red color, or sometimes they're white now. You have green on the old, the older leaves, and then there's this white on the tips. Those are actually not leaves. They're called bracts. I mean, not petals. They're called bracts. They're not flowers. They're leaves. And all that has to do with pigmentation, which we're going to talk about later in the program, why leaves change colors in the fall. But with poinsettias... This is a, a tough one, Debbie, because poinsettias are very, very, very um, responsive to light. And so if you have a poinsettia in daylight all the time, it is not going to change the color of those bracts, those sort of leaves. Um, you're going to have to put the poinsettia in a period of darkness. You're going to put the poinsettia in a period of darkness for an extended time. Now, let me, wh- while I uh, uh, talk about this, when you buy um, when you buy a poinsettia, what happens is that poinsettia has gone through a big, a big um, production facility where they actually have to cover greenhouses with this completely 
black um, tarp kind of stuff, plastic. And what that does is that allows the um, plant to go through this period of darkness that it requires in order to make those beautiful leaves that we like. Now, if that black plastic were to even have the hint of light shine through, just a pinhole of light that fills the, the whole crop could be destroyed. The whole crop could be destroyed. So it is going to be kind of tough for you to get them to rebloom. Generally, what happens is um, the... The best thing to do is just to go and purchase one, to go and purchase one. Um, if you're trying to get it to rebloom, the question is, how long will you have to do it? You want to keep it in bright light and water it only when the soil is dry to the touch. If the foil is around that pot, this is another thing for you, Debbie. If that foil, that beautiful little thing they put around to, to sell it, you got to remove it. And you need to place it in a saucer. That, that plastic can hold on to a lot hold on to a lot of moisture which can cause root rot but then you want to cut off those red um, the red leaves in January you want to leave the green leaves then when it's warm enough you can set them outside in April continue to cut them back um, to about six inches tall let them get flush let them get full again but as they reach resprout you can move them into more and more sunshine then you need to um, pot it up if you want to because by that time it's really grown it's in the summer and you want to fertilize it in April, June, and then again in August. And, and you can use a house plant fertilizer, some kind of slow release fertilizer. We can uh, help you with that at the uh, at the nursery, Lanier Nursery and Gardens and Flyer Branch. But as they grow bigger, you want to shorten the longest branches to just uh, a couple of times and make the plants nice and compact. Now here's the key: this is when you need to start doing the time change, the the, the light changes. In October, the very first of October, you can start with 14 hours of darkness and then 10 hours of bright light going back and forth. So got to put it on a calendar, put it on the clock, put it on your, um, put it on your, uh, your uh, time, whatever, schedule. 14 hours of darkness, then 10 hours of bright light. You keep doing that, and eventually they should be able to rebloom. Or Well, it's not really blooming, but they should be able to get those bracts colorful. So right now, you've got to start because we're already in November, kind of behind. 14 hours of darkness and 10 hours of bright light. If you can do that, Debbie, and take all of those tips, you can cycle that one plant over and over for the next few years to come. But that gives you a whole year's worth of poinsettia care and how to get it to go. So hope that helps, Debbie. If you have a question, you can uh, call us at 706-865-3181. Just hold on tight to this break, and we'll be right back with more gardening goodness. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in to 93.9 FM WRWH, Saturday mornings at 9. More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, welcome back, gang. You know, sometimes when you get out in the landscape and you start digging in a certain area, you find that uh, the, the soil is extremely very, it's very soft. It's nice, easy, easy, easy to work. And sometimes you get into certain areas and you find that the soil is very hard and it's um, hard to plow and hard to go through. Well, this morning we've been fumbling a little bit, but uh, we had a little snafu with our uh, Facebook Live. But hey, we're we're on Facebook Live this morning. If you want to join us there, you can type in a question in the comment section. And we can answer it on the line. We've got several people who've been watching throughout and joining us uh, that way. But uh, this morning, you can go to Lanier Nursery and Gardens Facebook page. Uh, just go to Facebook and type in Lanier, like the lake, Nursery and Gardens. And you click on the page there, and you'll be able to watch Buster and I as we plow this hard soil this morning. This soil is pretty hard this morning. So uh, feel free to check us out that way as well. Of course, uh, if you've missed old shows, uh, we do post them on YouTube.com every week. And you can listen um, and watch the video as well on YouTube.com. Just search W. WRWH, and you'll be able to find all of our past episodes um, of Let's Get Growing right there. Lastly, I do want to remind you that if you're away from the radio uh, for any reason, maybe because, uh, not Halloween, but Thanksgiving is on the on the rise, and maybe you'll be traveling uh, that weekend and uh, you would like to join us, you can. Just go to your uh, wherever you buy your apps on your smartphone and type in TuneIn. That's T-U-N-E-I-N, TuneIn, like you're tuning in to the radio. Type in 
and tune in and you'll find an application that you can download for free and you can search WRWH and you can like WRWH so that you get all the great program, programming um, minute by minute as it streams live over, over the internet. So a little later in the program, I am going to talk about why the leaves change. Um, tell you the science behind why the leaves change. It's not just that they're fading away. There's actually something going on there. And so if you hang on tight, we'll talk more about that. But until then, I do want to talk a little bit about grass. I don't like talking about grass because I would rather you have beautiful shrubs and trees and perennials that you buy from Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. But if you must have land, uh, lawn in your landscape, that's fine. What can you do this time of year? Now, the warm season grasses like Georgia and Bermuda are beginning to go dormant, and I have heard tell of some folks who's even had frost. I know this morning on my way in, it was 37 degrees. That's kind of scary. That means we're getting cold, getting cold. So nighttime temperatures are dropping. We've got to be careful, but the warm season grasses will be going dormant which means you pretty much have your last mow of the year. If you haven't done so already, you won't get much more growth from them unless we have some extremely warm days, but I doubt it. Uh, You'll see grasses like Bermuda and Georgia are going dormant. You mow them one more time. Be sure to raise your mower by one half inch to give them just a little bit of protection uh, throughout the winter, leaving the grass a little taller than you normally would. But that should be the last, uh, the last mow for the year. You do not want to uh, fertilize Bermuda, Georgia, or Centipede. You don't want to do that. You do not want to fertilize Bermuda, Georgia, or Centipede. They're not going to be growing. It's going to be a waste. If we did have another warm week, it may encourage some growth, and then that new growth could get damaged by our cold temperatures. Um, Lastly, though, you can fertilize fescue. You can fertilize fescue, or if you've uh, you've already kind of established an annual uh, winter grass, you could fertilize them, of course, but uh, you do not want to fertilize any of your warm season grasses. We do have a question coming in from our Facebook live stream. Uh, Lisa asks, can you plant trees? Yes, Lisa, you can plant as many trees as you like, and the more the merrier. And I've got plenty for you at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. This time of year, um, as we mentioned in the past couple of weeks, as we move into the cooler temperatures, the best time to plant is now. The best time to plant is while the plant is not growing. The plants now are losing their leaves. They're going dormant. They're not going to be using as much water as they would in the springtime or the summertime. Even though you can plant a containerized plant any time of the year, if that plant was grown in a container, it has its entire root system and can be grown any time of the year. But the best time... The absolute best time is now, and you can continue to do so as long as the ground is not frozen. So, folks, definitely, Lisa, come out and visit us at the nursery in Flower Branch. Again, that's Lanier Nursery and Gardens, and we can fill your garden with all of your tree desires, all that your landscape desires. We can help you with that. Um, While we're talking about trees, let's talk about a few plants that have absolutely great fall color. Absolutely great fall color. Number one, I would say, is ginkgo. Ginkgo is a very popular tree for um, shade. It does get large, but it grows slowly. So in a person's lifetime, it won't be some huge tree. But again, remember, when you plant a tree, you're planting for the future anyways. But ginkgo, when it turns, it turns this brilliant golden color. Beautiful. Probably the best consistent golden color you're going to find. And again, that's ginkgo. And a number, and another plant that you may um, that you may want to think about is called American strawberry bush, or commonly called also hearts of bursting. Hearts of bursting is a native plant, and we may have time to talk about native plants a little later, and maybe not. But we'll say that for another program. But native plants are great to use in the landscape. Um, native plants do provide for habitat for. Um, uh, birds and butterflies they need uh, host plants we can provide them with those through native plants but american strawberry bush or hearts of bursting does have this cool little fruit which opens up kind of burst open and has these seeds that kind of dangle out of them so it's kind of a cool plant that way but also the fall foliage is spectacular you know when you go up like uh to the mountains um and you see where they've planted just rows and rows of burning bush well burning bush is a bit about um, it, the burning bush is similar to our hearts of bursting. They're in the euonymus groups of plants, which doesn't really mean much, but they're closely related. But the burning bush that you see planted throughout the um, um, up and down the mountains is actually becoming invasive. It reseeds a bit, and it, it can populate on its own, which is scary. 
kind of scary because we don't want another kudzu out there, right? Or another privet. No way. But American strawberry bush is a native. It's not invasive. And uh, it gives you some beautiful fall color. I don't remember if I posted it or not, but on uh, if not... If it's not up there already on Facebook, you can go to Lanier Nursery and Gardens Facebook page, and I'll have it this afternoon. There is a picture of hearts are bursting, or will be a picture. I had a beautiful picture of it, and the fall color is just spectacular. Reds, yellows, kind of oranges all modeled together, and they're all placed on the Euonymus's green stem. Got a green stem with this beautiful contrasting red uh, foliage. So that would be another uh, selection for great fall color. And a third selection would be the Autumn Blaze Maple. If you want a consistent red, beautiful red, truly a, a blazing color. If you want that kind of color, you can go with an Autumn Blaze Maple. Of course, they make a nice shade tree. Um, could put them in the front yard, put them in the backyard, wherever. But they will light up your life right now, that's for sure, because they are looking gorgeous. A lot of them have dropped their leaves already, though. Uh, fourthly, uh, oak leaf hydrangea. Oak leaf hydrangea has these huge leaves that are shaped like an oak leaf, which is how it gets its name. But the oak leaf hydrangea will turn a brilliant red and kind of orangey color. I say brilliant, more of a deep red, I guess, more of like a blood red color. Great for Halloween now that Halloween's over, but a deep red color. And you can use that in the landscape. It's it's a larger shrub, but they in the summertime they have these beautiful cone shaped white flowers, really attractive. And I mean, some of these cone shapes could be probably twelve inches long, maybe maybe longer. So they they're just gorgeous. But the fall color now is outstanding with these huge, coarse textured leaves. Uh, fifthly, fifthly, or fifth in place, but probably one of the top is Father Gilla. And I've already mentioned it a little earlier, but I've got to mention it again because it. It is worth mentioning. Father Gilla is a wonderful plant that um, has these beautiful bottle brush flowers in the spring. And then as the and, and they're on naked stems. Wonderful architecture. Remember I, I mentioned thinking about the architecture of a plant. The shape of the plant is similar to witch hazel because it's, it's in the witch hazel group. And they do share some similarities. But after the bottle brush white flowers are done fading, then leaves start coming out in the summertime. And they're this blue, ashy color. Underneath, it's like a silver lining. You know how every cloud has a silver lining? Well, every leaf on a Father Gilla has a silver color underneath, which gives a good contrast to the blue color on top of the leaf. And then this time of year, you get probably the most outstanding fall color. Boy and gr- boys and girls... This plant out uh, surpasses fall color on burning bush any day. It is modeled with greens, oranges, yellows, and reds all on the same leaf. There are some examples that are just gorgeous. Now, fall color, and we're going to talk about fall color a little more extensively after the break, but uh, the Father Gilla fall color is just absolutely uh, outstanding, and you really can't get it anywhere else. Talking about fall color, there is a science behind it. And as we um, drive home here, we're going to get back and talk more about the details about fall color and why the leaves change. So hang on tight for that for sure. But really quickly, um, one last tip that you need to be aware of is pruning. Do you need to prune now? Absolutely not. You do not need to do any kind of pruning. If you want to deadhead something, okay, go ahead maybe. But you don't really want to, to do any major pruning. You want to hold off onto all of that until spring. So again, hold off onto pruning. What's going to happen is you're going to be left with a wound that's not going to heal over winter. And then you're left with damage. You don't want any damage. Folks, you don't want any damage, so don't prune major things right now. Wait. But wait on me to come back because I'll be right back with a little more information about fall color and what's actually going on in those trees and those leaves. We'll be right back. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in to 93.9 FM WRWH Saturday mornings at 9. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, welcome back, gang. We are here, and we are talking all things fall because it's beautiful out there. It's gorgeous out there. Uh, Lisa asked a question on Facebook. If you uh, haven't joined us on Facebook, feel free to. Uh, today, you can go to Lanier Nursery and Garden's uh, Facebook page, and there you can find us on Facebook, and we're streaming live, and you can type your garden questions there. We'll be glad to answer them. But Lisa asks um, what we could tell her about the uh, hydro planting towers. Now, I assume we're talking about... Um, Hydroponics, which of course would be using water in place of soil as a way to grow plants, become very popular. And to some degree, I would say it's becoming 
the way to grow um, plants in the future because retail space, you know, on the farm is shrinking. We're, we have more people. Cities are expanding. Metro areas are expanding. There's less and less land. But with a hydro, a hydro a hydroponics, you can plant vertically even. Now, um, they are an intense system, though. They are an intense system. You can use hydroponics in greenhouses. You can use them outside of greenhouses. Um, however, you're always wanting your water to flow. You want your water to move. You can't just plant something in a stagnant water unless it's a, you know, a pond type plant. But if you have water that's moving, you, you still need oxygen. The plant needs oxygen at its root. So it can't be just septic in, in sitting in water. But as long as your system, whether it's a tower shape like Lisa's alluding to, or maybe a trough shape or a bucket shape, as long as you have a steady flow of water and there's plenty of oxygen in the soil, I mean soil, in, in, in the water, then you should be fine. And you can plant things like um, tomatoes and cucumbers. Uh, you could do flowers. Uh, you can do uh, pretty much an endless supply of plants. But um, it is an intensive system, and it's not going to be an organic system. Okay, hydroponics is not an organic system really uh, – Possibly if you use some uh, or liquid organic food, um, but then you get the increased chance of algae and things like that. But you will need to use a, um, a fertilizer in the, in the water, and you'll have to um, uh, dilute it in such a way into your watering system that you give the, the plants the kind of nutrients that they need. And just So depending on what you're growing, tomatoes, cucumbers, could be different. But you will actually release the uh, a what we call a water soluble fertilizer, which means it will um, dilute in water, it'll dissolve in water, and it moves through the system just against the roots. And it's generally these are closed systems, so you could do this on your back porch if you just need a little water pump and a bucket or two or a planting tower, and you could use misters. And every few uh, few minutes or seconds, the misters come on, give the roots a nice mist, and then. Um, you get a little oxygen and then a mist again, a little oxygen, so kind of a cycle. But you would have to set up a pretty good system, and there is some good resources online. Um, and I know there are some, uh, I've seen some hydroponic books, uh, e-books uh, on Amazon.com that you could probably look into for more information and more of the details, which, of course, we don't have the time for um, at the moment. But that gives you kind of an introduction, Lisa, into hydroponics and what you can do with that. So as I promised, we're going to talk now a little bit more about Paul, a uh, fall, not Paul, but fall i don't know who paul is but fall and um on lanier nursery gardens uh web page we have an area for articles and we've just got a few but one of them is the pigmentation of fall color and what happens the question is you know plant leaves are different colors because of pigments but why are some trees yellow in the fall some are orange some are red and others have a combination of all these colors well here's the answer the leaf color is actually the product of the interaction of different types of pigments in a, in a plant leaf. Now, this can get really scientific really quick, so I'm going to try to keep all of the big words down because they don't mean much to us, but I'll, 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 I'll make it more simplified. There are two factors um, that, base, that, that, uh, that directly affect the uh, color that we actually see. The first factor is the type of pigment that is in the leaf, and the second is the amount of the pigments that's in the leaf. Now, there are a few different types of pigments. Um, number one, there is a pigment called chlorophyll. Now, you're probably familiar with chlorophyll because chlorophyll is the green pigment. And we're used to seeing that all year long, the green colors. There's even plenty of green on the leaves right now. But that is chlorophyll, and it's what gives the green color. Now, there are some other ones like lycopene and carotene, which you're probably familiar with in tomatoes because lycopene um, is found in that red color of the tomatoes. Uh, uh, carotene is found in the orange and yellows of carrots and whatnot, and flavanol. These are all colors that give us. Now, there's another one called anthocyanin, which... Let's forget that big word, but it's basically the reds, the blues, and the purples, uh, the magenta colors, which are absolutely gorgeous. If you don't have that, then you'll definitely need to get some, and we have some plants that give you that red, bluish, uh, deep purple colors at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, like Loripedlum. Loripedlum is a great one that we see. But the next question is, so how do these pigments work, and how do they interact in such a way that they create such stunning colors? Well, so we know there's different types of um we know that there's different types of pigments we've just talked about, and they all give these different colors. Now, 
What happens during the growing season is we normally see green because chlorophyll is like a boss, and he takes over. He fills the leaf with these uh, these little chlorophyll pigments, and the the only thing that you see is the green. The green masks all the other colors, but those other colors, those other pigments, they're there too. They're hiding. They're being covered up by the chlorophyll. But guess what? In the fall, chlorophyll breaks down, and the big boss starts to slowly inch away and then these other colors are revealed okay so that's why you kind of see um a change from green to orange to yellow to red some some plants go straight to yellow and then they turn brown some plants go green yellow red or some go green orange red whatever it may be and it's just the way that those plants are have been um, created in such a way that as the pigments break down another color is revealed Another color is revealed. And I think it's a great way um, that you can see, for instance, the red maples go from green to red. But then the American beech trees, they go from green to yellow. And boy, if you want a beech tree, you need one because they have a beautiful fall color. Beech trees have some beautiful fall color. So it's not like the plants are just dying or the leaves are just dying. They are dying in a sense. They are slowly losing their, their life. But... What's actually happening is a new pigment is being revealed as other pigments fade away. So that's what's happening there. Now, here's an interesting fact. You know, you have some variegated leaves. There's variegated hydrangeas. There's variegated evergreens. There are variegated like uh, laura pedlums or whatever. These variegated plants have leaves that um, due to the different types of pigments there and concentration, some of these pigments are located in a certain area of the leaf itself. So in other words, when you see all the twisted mottled colors of one, one uh, say a, um, there's a hydrangea that has, no, let's talk about a dogwood. There's a dogwood called wolf eyes, and it has a green and a white all mixed together. And in the, the white zones there, it's like a bright yellow. Those have a thick vein of um the certain pigment that gives it that color and then a thick vein of green and they're just all mixed and modeled together very interesting you may see that pigments gather to the edge of the plant or pigments gather to the middle while others group here and there and that's how variegated leaves work too so it's all about pigmentation all about color now that's a little bit of science for the day i think that we've had plenty of science and we don't need any more of that but that gives you an idea when you look out there at the beauty of the of the fall color fall foliage just remember, just remember that the um, what's going on is science, and what's going on is one pigment is dying out while the others are now being revealed. So, remember we started off with a, a nice little quote from our uh, famous Southern gardener, Elizabeth Lawrence. She says that even if something is left undone, everyone must take time to sit still and watch the leaves turn. And that's what I would inspire you to do. What I would urge you to do today is, you know, you've got a lot of things to do, and we need to get them done. If you want to do planting, you've got to do your planting. You've got to come visit me at the nursery at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. You've got to come see me this weekend. We have some beautiful pansies for sale. Just a few mums left, but they're on special. We have plenty of trees and shrubs to get your landscape really going and attractive. But after all the work is done, and even if something doesn't get done, don't be upset. What we need to do is just sit back, relax, enjoy nature, enjoy your garden, and watch the leaves turn. Watch as the chlorophyll breaks down. (laughs) Watch as the carotenoids and the flavonoids come to life and show you that beautiful red, orange, uh, magenta fall color. Go ahead and take a trip. Go ahead and get out of the garden, maybe. Take a trip to another person's garden. Go to one of our um, private gardens around the state. We've had uh, Hills and Dales on, um, uh, a lady from Hills and Dales Estate, which is part of the Callaway Gardens down in uh, Pine Mountain, Georgia. Go and visit um, some gardens and get some ideas this fall. Uh, Enjoy the leaves. Don't just, you know, get uh, strapped down to, to this cold weather. Put on a coat. Put on a jacket. Get out there. Get your hands dirty. And... Also, be sure to enjoy nature. That's what it's all about. Folks, I hope that you'll join us next week because uh, next week we've got more gardening goodness. We're going to keep on talking about garden, this uh, gardening throughout the winter. You've got to be out there all winter long doing something, and we want to be here to help remind you 
to help give you an ideas of what you need to do, inspiration. We're going to keep that up. We'll have special guests on um, as we move forward throughout the season. It's probably going to be a good time for us to bring on special guests to talk about different aspects of gardening and horticulture, to get you to meet some folks who are around who are around uh, the state or maybe beyond the state. Um, and uh, definitely get some ideas and inspiration from other people to see what's going on. I want to remind you that if you've missed any part of this program, any part of our discussion today, that you can visit, revisit <laughs> this, uh, this hour on YouTube.com. Uh, in a day or two, we will have the uh, show put up. Of course, we'll have our uh, recording put up within 24 hours, but uh, we'll have our live stream as well from Facebook on YouTube. So be sure to check us out on youtube.com just search wrwh and then look for the let's get growing playlist and you can look by date again today is november 3rd so you'll definitely want to uh, check us out there folks it's been an exciting hour we have plowed the fields we'll say it was a rough plow but we are doing it and we will see you next week right here on wrwh for let's get growing thank you i'm nathan wilson we'll see you next week Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at LanierNurseryGardens.com. Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.